So with Module 8 of New Testament Survey, we come to the final book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. What we know from the text itself is that the book of Revelation is written as a kind of revelatory vision um, from the Greek word apokalypsis, which literally means to reveal, but is probably better translated as something like to disclose or to uncover or to unveil. So the book of Revelation is written as a kind of revelatory unveiling or a visionary unveiling of the person of Jesus Christ from the perspective of one who calls himself John, who identifies himself in the text as, quote, your brother who shares with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom and the patient endurance. This author, John, tells us that he has been exiled by way of political exile to the island of Patmos, and that this political exile is the result of, quote, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And he tells us further that he received this vision of Jesus in the spirit on the Lord's day. The book itself take shape as a letter that is written to seven churches in Asia. And it has frequent references throughout to persecution that these churches are facing and gives these churches guidance in the face of intense persecution. This frequent reference to persecution indicates that the book was probably written during the time somewhere about the reign of Domitian, which occurred between 81 and 96 AD, in which the cult of emperor worship in the Roman Empire was especially flourishing in the area of Asia in which these seven churches existed. The churches were under persecution not only for not worshiping the emperor of Rome, but also for their refusal to participate in those practices that were tied up with acknowledging the Roman Empire's ultimate power. That is the political, economic, and social and religious practices of the empire. So in short, we could say that the book of Revelation is written as a kind of political resistance document or political resistance letter or literature to these seven churches in Asia, which is meant to encourage these churches in their resistance to the Roman Empire. The book refuses throughout to acknowledge the ultimate legitimacy or authority of any earthly rulers or structures, and it looks defiantly in its tone and in its writing to the coming of God's reign in which all things will be subjected finally to the authority of Jesus Christ. In this way, it's a letter that is written meant especially to rally the churches in Asia in their stance as a courageous witness against a culture that is dangling before them seductive comforts and luxuries and political and social and religious leisures that would come if they just turned themselves away from the worship of Jesus Christ alone and participated fully in the Roman Empire through worship of the emperor himself. Now, to understand why this political resistance was so important and the nature of this political resistance, we need to look a little bit closer at what it means to say that this is a book about, quote, the revelation of Jesus Christ, as it says right away in chapter 1, verse 1. To say that this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ is, in a sense, to say that the book of Revelation is one more way of approaching the question that we have been asking ourselves throughout this module, and that we saw raised explicitly at the beginning of this course with the Gospels. And that is the question, who is Jesus Christ? The book of Revelation wants to address that question, who is Jesus Christ? But to do it especially from the perspective of Christ's reign and triumph over the powers of sin and death and the establishment of the new creation here on earth. And so the book of Revelation is especially concerned to identify Jesus as a kind of king, 
And it uses these royal metaphors, these kingly metaphors, throughout the book to talk about the way in which Jesus is a king who has won the victory over the powers of sin and evil. Christ's lordship, furthermore, his kingship, stands in flat contradiction to that of Caesar's, to the kings of this world. To quote Revelation 11.15, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Jesus has taken control over the kingdom of the world. The reign of God is incompatible with the kingdom set up by human beings, and especially incompatible with that kingdom that is set up by Caesar during the time of Rome. Furthermore, the nature of this kingship is really to be understood in terms of the key central metaphor that is used to talk about Jesus throughout the book of Revelation. And that is the image or the metaphor of the slain lamb, or, quote, the lamb that was slaughtered. This image of a slain lamb, which is used 28 times throughout the book of Revelation, first appears in Revelation 5, where John is lamenting the fact that there is no human ruler who is deemed worthy to open the scroll that contains the secret to the meaning of history. But when John says this, he sees standing in his vision of this throne room, of this palace room, this this one that he calls the Lion of Judah, who does not appear as a kingly conqueror in this vision, but rather, quote, as a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. The contrast could not be clearer. Rome rules by the power of violence, but the one who is the true king rules by his submission unto death, precisely the opposite of armed violence against the empire. The same image is set before us in the climactic battle scene of Revelation 19, where Jesus is famously presented as the conquering one who rides in on a white horse, who is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. But as we read further into Revelation 19 itself, we find that this is not the blood of the enemies which Jesus has slaughtered that is on his robe, but rather his own blood that was shed at the hands of these enemies. Because of this vision of being a slain lamb throughout the book, Jesus is seen throughout Revelation as being that one faithful witness who conquers the power of sin and death by the power of his sufferings. Along these same lines, then, in the book of Revelation, the church is identified, and you see this especially in chapters 12 through 14 of Revelation, as that people who follow Jesus by bearing prophetic witness against the violence, immorality, and injustice of an earthly empire that claims an authority that belongs to God alone. Right? Get this. The problem with the empire is that it claims an authority that belongs to God alone, and precisely because of this is immoral, violent, and unjust. So in Revelation 14, the 144,000 that we say belong to the number, that is said to belong to the number that, that, that will be redeemed on the final day, are said to be those who, quote, follow the lamb wherever he goes. Follow the slain lamb wherever he goes. This means that Jesus' followers worship God by refusing in Revelation chapter 14 to receive the mark of the beast, thereby excluding themselves from the political and economic practices of the Roman system. Now, a lot has been made about this image of the mark of the beast in Revelation throughout biblical interpretation, but biblical scholars are agreed at least upon the idea that this mark is probably referring to a common identifying mark that was given to Roman citizens at the time who had paid their taxes, who have given to worship to Caesar in the Roman temples, and who therefore have been granted full participation as citizens in Rome's politics and Rome's economy. 
The disciple in the book of Revelation, then, is one who becomes a witness to Jesus through the call to suffer as a martyr. The word martyr in the Greek literally is translated as witness. And so every time you see this word witness in the book of Revelation, referring to either Jesus or to Jesus' followers, it is the word martyr or martyria in Greek. The church is called to be this martyr people. It is called to witness to the reign of God by suffering as Jesus Christ suffered in the face of evil to resist the idolatrous and unjust means of power and violence, is to follow the will of God, who has chosen to overcome evil through righteous suffering. In other words, the faithful witness to the reign of God is that existence of a people, a church, who follow the way of Jesus by submitting even to death, without recourse to the violence and injustice of the empire's idolatrous political and economic structures. To witness to the reign of God is precisely to refuse the violence and unjustness, the evil of the empire, even to the point of death. In closing, It is important to note that the book of Revelation begins with the promise that the time is near, and it ends with the cry, Come, Lord Jesus, in 2220. The coming of Jesus Christ is near, according to the author John in the book of Revelation. The alternative order of the reign of God is so close, it is what we would call as imminent. As Jesus, is prom- as Jesus himself promised in Revelation 22:20, 20, Surely I am coming soon, he says. The promise of Jesus' coming is to be understood in terms of the book of Revelation's final vision of a new Jerusalem, which is described in Revelation 21. This new Jerusalem is one in which all people will worship the slain lamb who is himself the presence of God's glory. God here promises a new heaven and a new earth, but this new heaven and new earth are seen as being established by heaven's coming down to earth and transforming creation through the lives of those who follow the slain lamb, through the lives of the disciples who are themselves martyrs, witnesses to the way of Jesus' own suffering in the world. See, I am coming soon, Jesus says. My reward is with me to repay everyone according to everyone's work.